Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to another episode of My Angular Story. I'm your host, Aaron Frost, and today our guest is Brad McAllister. How you doing, Brad? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. You, uh, wh- what's your time zone? Central. Central, so, so you're yeah. an hour ahead? Okay. Yeah. All right. Hour ahead of you. So I'm in Oklahoma. Yeah, okay. Oklahoma City or where? And Tulsa. Tulsa, okay. Yeah. Tulsa's cool. great. I like Tulsa. I used to hate it, but I grew up and it got better and all kinds of things, so... Good. Now I really like it. Good. How's, uh, I know you're, you're doing a lot of talks at conferences. How, how's your last few months been busy or been slow or. Yeah, it's been really busy, not too busy, but pretty busy because you got to juggle work and side projects and conference talks and yeah. learning, continual learning, yeah. all that you, kind of stuff. So you're at Denver giving a talk. Yep. I did NG comp and that was with Ryan Shanky. Actually, all of these with, were with Ryan. Um, did uh, NG Comp and we did Angular Denver and then we did NGDE in Berlin oh, cool. and that that was a lot of fun. That is cool. That yeah. would be fun. How was a good? Doing? He's doing good. good. Yeah, he's That's doing good. good. He's uh up in the Great White North, just living yeah. life, doing his own podcast, I think, and uh, all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah, he's a good guy. I like Ryan a lot. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. So some people might not know who you are you know i've 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 seen you for years now um yep go ahead and can you just kind of let let everyone know who you are because this is this is all about getting to know your angular story so yeah sure um i am let's see let's well basically let's just start here i am a software developer and an engineering lead of a product for a company called sapphire digital um we do kind of healthcare transparency software for uh, insurance companies. So they'll um, buy our product and we provide, based on their cost data for claims and stuff, we provide kind of like shopping for healthcare. So we provide different costs for different facilities, uh, for different procedures. The thing I work on is called Smart Shopper. And it's essentially exactly that, shopping for healthcare, because you don't know when you go to, you know, if a doctor recommends, hey, you need a, a knee replacement, so just go over here and get one. To this hospital saint saint knee replacement you don't exactly know how saint much knee replacement. Cost. that's yeah. a great that's a great yeah. hospital isn't it yeah yeah i was trying to think of something fun but yeah. anyway um you uh you don't know you, you're shopping and are you're able to go on there and shop and say hey uh, the knee replacement at hospital a is thirty thousand. Knee replacement hospital b is twenty thousand. but the quality rating is still the same as far as you know confidence that you've looked up on Google, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it really does matter where you park your car. It's crazy yeah. because of all the, the contracts and that kind of stuff with insurance companies. Um, you don't know it's, I mean, they could be, it could be zero difference, especially for routine stuff like MRIs. They all have the same machine and they all send the results over to Australia for the same doctors to read from two facilities, but one facility might cost 5,000 and one cost 2000. So what smart shopper does is, is surfaces that for you. And if you choose a lower cost option, more times than not, you'll get an incentive check also. Hmm. So there's an incentive for you to choose the lower cost one um, because you're saving money, your co-insurance is gonna be cheaper, and you're gonna get a check for anywhere from 50 to 500 bucks, just depends on the cost Hmm. and the procedure and stuff. So anyway. That's pretty cool. That's what I do. The whole medical billing is, I feel like, a magic eight ball is more transparent than like medical billing. Like, uh, absolutely. If the doctor said, Hey, 
go get medicine A, right? Uh-huh. Um, I don't even know what that's going to cost before I get to the, to the place to buy it. A, like that's the first thing. He doesn't say ish, 20 bucks ish. He doesn't say that. Nope. Or she, you know, depending on the doctor, right? But they don't, they don't tell me. So then, I, and it, further, I don't know, like, it'd be nice if the doctor was like, just so you know, it's twice as cheap at store B versus store C. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll go to store B. Like, I don't really care. Uh, yeah. You know, if it's $10 or 20 I'll go to the one that's closer. But I have no vision into it, right? Like, I just show up and here's my debit card. Uh, I'm going to pay whatever the dollar amount you said. So I feel like magic eight balls are more transparent than anything I've ever dealt with in the medical industry. Totally. Totally. Just well, that's cool that you get to work in and help make that less crazy. Yeah, it is cool. I actually like it. Um, yeah. And we're trying to, I mean, we're, we're trying to drive down health healthcare costs by doing this, by forcing people to not just go where the doctor says to go because he's got to deal with them or where the insurance company says to go because they have a deal. Like, just, you know, obviously you want to go somewhere that's good. And yeah. so we're not like, go to this van back in the alley. It's not that, yeah. but, um, but yeah, things cost different at different hospitals because of contracts, essentially. Yeah. I mean, it's if crazy. it's 2000 versus 5,000 and it's the same quality. Exactly. Well, then you're going to go with the two. Unless I you think most people will. don't care about your co-payment. Yeah. I mean, 10% of 2000 is way less than 10% of 5,000. Yeah, exactly. Or 20% or 30%, whatever it is. Yeah, whatever your deductible is. Yeah. Um, I suppose if you've already met your out-of-pocket max for the year, you wouldn't really care, but... That's probably true. But if you're getting a $500 rebate check, you might. That's also true. Yeah. And I, right now, I, don't even, I didn't even know that was a thing because I've never even been given an option. So... Yeah. It's, that smart shopper sounds cool. It is cool. It started in New Hampshire, and it's kind of grown out from there. Um, we just don't have clients in every state yet. For all the listeners in other countries, they're like, what? I know. Paying? A, what, why are you guys paying money? Exactly. Stuff? Yeah. It's what we know. Yeah, you do what, you, you do what you're told to do. Anyway, um, okay, so, I mean, I've seen you, even though I've only gotten to know you in the last few years, I've seen you for, I don't know, half a decade. At You've been to NGConf and other conferences I've been at yeah. for a while. For mostly NG Comp, but this year was my fourth year. Okay, yeah. So I've yeah. seen you for a while. And uh, so is your fourth year, is your first time speaking, though? It was my first time speaking. Was that your first talk ever, or was that just your first uh, NG Comp talk? Or? Uh, it was pretty much my first talk ever to anything that was not like a little work gathering or something like that. Okay. So you're not like this giant meetup speaker that gives talks at meetups every month. Well, you weren't. I weren't. Okay. I weren't. I weren't. You weren't. I weren't. I weren't Um, that. No, but uh, I am scheduled scheduled to go to Oklahoma City to speak at OKCJS in November, um, which is cool. Yeah. And I started a little Angular Tulsa meetup with three other guys um, last week. Oh, cool. So So, you're a meetup organizer now. Maybe. We had beers and talked about Angular. (laughs) <laughs> it counts i think i think so it's gonna grow it's gonna grow but i finally found uh three other people that were interested in getting together to talk about angular and tulsa so like you know what let's do this and see where it goes let's make it a thing well, that's yeah good. that's how that's how they start you know yeah it's it's it was enjoyable i enjoyed it all right so now you're a conference speaker a meetup organizer officially because you've organized one sure you're organizing your second one who else are you? Uh, I am a second career dev. What does that mean? You had a career before this? I had an IT career before this, so I'm kind of in the same tech sphere, but not as a developer. I did Windows, admin, system admin, all that kind of stuff. So typical IT guy, corporate IT guy, managing servers and desktops and all that stuff. And I did that for 12 years because back in 98, was it 98? No. 97. I really found, I found web development really earlier than that, but um, I liked it and I was just doing HTML. I hadn't even really gotten into CSS yet. And so you're talking I, HTML with all inline styling. Yes. Okay. Tables for layout, all that kind of junk. 
Yep. Really ugly nineties internet stuff. Yep. Um, and I got to talk to a guy who was in the internet or web sphere. Um, but he was a hosting guy and he ran a hosting company and he gave me a very bad piece of advice then. Well, then it may have been a good piece of advice, but it was very bad. Now, um, there is no money in web design. There's a lot of money in web hosting. Hmm. And so that's when I kind of said, Oh, well, maybe I don't need to do this. And I started going the IT route hmm. um, and then got pigeonholed in there for 12 years until I was able to actually break out into full-time development. Oh, and cool. it was really lucky. I had a good place with a good boss that let me do double duty where I was doing IT stuff, but we also started working with the, uh, main developer who was mostly back end stuff. And we did a uh, web app for the company and they let me take the reins on the front end and do that. And we did that in jQuery. What year? 2000 and what year is it? Probably 13. Okay. One of the things that I find that we talk a lot about at the different conferences and the different things that I'm working on is open source software. And a lot of people have a lot of ideas around open source software but we don't often think about the people who are building it and trying to maintain it. And I had a friend, John, who came to me. He's been a guest on JavaScript Jabber a couple of times. He came and he actually said, hey, Chuck, I wish there was a show about sustaining open source. And that really hit me where I live. And I have a few other friends who are working on projects related to this. So we all got together and we put together a show called Sustain Our Software. You can find it at sustainoursoftwarepodcast.com. And it's a place where several people who are passionate about open source come together and have conversations about how it can be sustained and how it can be maintained and what we can do to help these maintainers continue to deliver us value that we build our software on. Most of the software we're building is based on open source. And so it's important to us to have that maintained and have it taken care of. Come check it out. It's been really interesting to listen to the conversations that they're having from people who are working in it all the time and just hear what they have to say about it. Once again, that's at sustainoursoftwarepodcast.com. So Angular was out, but it was like 0.06. Yeah, it was like 0.0. Yeah, it was oh something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I looked, I briefly found it before I started, but I was on Windows and I couldn't, and I wasn't very experienced really yet and really couldn't get it to work. I don't know. I don't know what I did wrong, but um so we built this thing in jQuery and then probably a year later, Angular was at like 0.08 maybe. And I found it again and it actually, I was able to get it working at the time and I was able to reduce all my jQuery code by like 70%, especially oh, yeah. when it came to dealing with data and the two-way data binding and all that stuff. Yeah. And so I ran with, with AngularJS at that point. Well, at that point it was just Angular, but um, ran with that and rewrote the jQuery app and we did a couple more apps and um, we finally moved me over to be a programmer and backfilled my tech position. Mm. And so that was the beginning of my full-time development career. Your new career. And I was That's there for cool. two years. And uh, because I was a programmer now and not a tech guy, I lost all my seniority and got laid off, um, mm. which was awesome. But it was, it was, it, it, you know, those things always suck, but, um, it really opened a lot of doors for me because I found the current place, which was then called Vitals, which is now Sapphire Digital. And it's just been it's really been good, good for me. It's been, been amazing. That's awesome. So yeah, I've learned so much and met good people and really, really love what I do. So that's awesome. It was the right, right move and the right decision. And I'm very, very, very glad that I did it. Well, that's good. It's always interesting how people roll with the punches and usually usually people see it's see how it's good for them right like they see they're able to see the good the silver lining to being laid off and stuff so that's good um oh, yeah so you've been at sapphire digital then for like uh five years almost five years it'll be five five years in march so okay. four and a half and what's your title there I am a software engineering lead. So I'm now the team lead over um, that over Smart Shopper. And me and my now boss, former coworker, um, basically started it as a Greenfield project to move it into Angular. It was already a product, um, but it was in .NET and uh, I think Razor. And they had a little bit of AngularJS mixed up in there. 
And we just kind of abandoned all of that, started it over with Angular 4, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and just built it up from scratch. .NET Core on the back end because this group is a .NET, um, a .NET shop. But yeah, it's really interesting. We, we spent a lot of time getting it to run on the Mac. I wrote a blog post about setting up Angular with .NET Core in Visual Studio on a Mac that I thought was cool, but it didn't get much traction. <laughs> I'm like, this is new. No one's ever done this. So, um, so we did that for efficiency's sake. So the, the Angular app actually lives in the, the .NET solution for ease of deployment and ease of the backend guys running it. And now we're looking at splitting it out because it's gotten big enough in each thing. We did it right as far as uh, making restful calls to the back end, even though it lived in there. So they're really two separate apps. They just kind of live together. So thinking about splitting it out into its own repo to really take advantage of the tooling like um, ng deploy, possibly, I don't know, a lot of stuff. But it's getting big enough where it needs to come out into its own. And I took it out and it just runs. If you run the back end, everything's still there. And it's just, it doesn't matter where it lives. It's kind of cool. That's good. So uh, let's, let's get into some uh, Brad specific knowledge for the community. What, uh, what do you think is like an important thing for the community to know right now? If, as, as, a, as a leader of a team, what would you share some of that leadership advice with like, the community? Hey, like X is important or we need to do Y or what are you thinking? I think we always need to keep learning. Um, I mean, there's no, there's no question about that. You need to keep learning. You need to keep finding new things. You don't want to live on the bleeding edge so much that nothing works, you know, and you're, you're pigeonholed to one browser or whatever, but you also need to make sure you're not just falling back on old things. Cause that's what, you know, um, there's a 101 ways to do things. Um, and I think if you're always learning and learning the new way to do things, even if it's great, even though it's not great, and I'm not saying just go out and take the new thing and run with it, but make sure you're aware and you know what's out there um, and then pick the best thing at the time to use, whether that's, you know, case in point, whether that's like a, a for loop or a for each or filter or map or something like that. Like yeah. know what your options are and pick the best one and don't just fall back on something because either you're new to the language or it's just the way you've always done it or whatever. Yeah. So, um, so give me an example though. That's, that's really good advice. Tell me something you've learned by continue. Like as you just, you know, staying current, continue education, what are some things you've learned? Like, just give, give me a recent one in the last 12 months of, a, a thing you did differently and then you learn no, and then now you do it differently. Give me mm, let me think about that. That's good. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. No, that's just me being dumb. So, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like I, there's no dumb shaming here. That's true. It was hilarious actually. So, so I'm working on an app and I, and break, like refactoring an app. So I broke out the, the components into their own little non-flat structure and um, broke that, the routing up because all the routes were in the main routing file and some of them had child routes. So I broke them up and put them in the component folders, in the module folders, and then nothing was working. And I couldn't figure it out. And I tweeted to Craig Spence. Um, he was in the middle of getting a tattoo, so but it was on his leg, so he had his hands free. So he's sitting there typing back to me, and I'm showing him screenshots and showing him code, and they were like, everything looks great. And then we're like, why is it not working? And then I saw that I had not imported my new routing module into my module, and so it just didn't work. And I spent time, and I spent Craig's time, and it was just like, ah, apparently you have to do that. So... That's not really learning. That's just a Brad did a dumb thing. Sorry. So let me so, think about, yeah. Sorry. So I'll, I'll share a couple. So like, um, I remember, I remember like when I was first learning RxJS, people were telling me to use it a lot. Like I was using promises. And so I found it very handy for that stuff. Cause I could combine two or three of them together and then I could call subscribe and I could get the data out and it was very easy, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I would just take the data out of the subscription and put it onto the components, you know, instance to this. And, uh, and I was good. 
And then everyone largely, like very quickly, were like as uh, it got groundswell, even though it had existed for a while, people were like, really quickly like, no, do they sing pipe? You know, and and I didn't really know what that was. And mm-hmm. so I started using it. And so well, that's an example of I had to keep watching and learning to know, hey, that's a real thing. And then like, what is, I, I keep like this year, a term I had to learn was imperative coding versus declarative coding. I I, I hear those words and they, they sounded ethereal. They didn't have tangible meanings to me, mm-hmm. but I heard them regularly. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to go learn what those are. And um, putting a wrapper around that helped me understand what the speaker was then saying. Because if someone says, don't do blah, 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 do blah, and you don't know what either of those two words meant, the, the talk is, you know, largely not helpful. So right. you do have to sometimes, it does mean extend, ex- expand your vocabulary a bit. And so it's, uh, and so all of a sudden learning the definition of it changed the meaning of the talk and what I took away from it. So, yeah, I think it's, it's very important to, to stay on top of learning and watch the trends in the community. Anyway, um, did you come up with one? Yeah, so okay. two. One along those lines is I was listening to, I don't remember what episode it was, but it was Angular or Adventures in Angular, and you guys were talking about indirection a lot. And I'm like, what is indirection? And so then I ended up, I think, watching a talk from Angular Connect, maybe. I don't remember. But then the speaker went over indirection, and I'm like, oh. Oh, well, that's helpful because when I was listening to the thing, I'm like, I don't even know what indirection is. But then after the fact, it was within like a day. I heard that. And I'm like, oh, great. Now I think I know what it is. But now I think I've forgotten it anyway. So in one ear, out the other. The other one, though, happened today. We had a method. We're trying to do some weird validation stuff. And uh, the guys on my team were working on it. And they had this big function with four different observables inside so they could watch four different things and um, return a true or false if everything was true or one thing was false. And they were trying to subscribe to a list of subscriptions. And so I'm like, well, let's go look at the docs, you know, and I know that combined latest, but I wasn't sure if it was going to fit this deal. But we went to the docs and looked at combined latest. We tried it. It worked great. So that's one thing that, you know, had we not even bothered to go looking for that, we wouldn't have known and we ended up yeah. with bad code and yeah. Yeah, totally. Adventures in Angular is a devchat.tv production made in partnership with Hero Devs. Hero Devs is a group of Angular experts who can help your team code like true developer heroes. If your team needs an Angular expert, reach out to Aaron at hero.dev today. And um, NX is a big one. So I've been spending a lot of time recently trying to learn NX in the content, like in the context of Angular elements. So like Ryan and I's talk has been basically using Angular elements to create web components that then you can drop into React or Vue or whatever. The talk center's on, you can drop it in into React, but you, I mean, it can go anywhere. Um, you're, and then- You're only focusing on React just to make the point, right? You're not- Right, actually, just the point, no, yeah. You're not like advocating, hey, always do this with react apps you're just trying to make the point you could do that right exactly okay. it's just a it's just an example so okay. it's like hey you could do this and then if you're an angular team that buy you know that bought or an angular company that bought a react company then your angular people can write components and drop them into react and and they work you know, just like the and they works work. yeah yeah they do yeah. um but yeah nx so jeff cross said in when we were in berlin he said why why don't you use nx for this for like uh, I don't know. It's a good question. So I've been playing with NX. I trying don't to get, know what NX is. <laughs> yeah, because I saw NX and I'm like, it looks so big and so complicated and so, so much. Um, but it's not that bad. It's really actually really, really stinking cool. Um, so that's something I've been spending a lot of time on just the last three or four weeks is just trying to dig into NX and figure out how to do a um, <clears throat> uh, Angular Elements basically do a library of UI components in NX and then build an elements app in the apps that then you can build the elements app to pull that library in 
and then spit it out to Elements, but also have your main app, which that could be a docs site if you're building reusable components for people, or it could be uh, your actual app that you use um, that you're just pulling in, um, pulling in these library elements, but you also need to make them available to the outside world. So you have the best of both worlds. You write one UI component in a library, and then you can export it to elements and it goes in your app, but it's not an element in your app. So it works in native angular, but you can still export it as an element. Um, mm -hmm. I'm getting close on that. I'm having some fun issues with like using material, angular material and it not building out any of the material components in the library mm. when I, when I export it as an element. So mm. that's my, that's what I'm learning right now. Mm. And banging my head against a brick wall, trying to figure that out. So can we say one thing about NX real quick? Can we just yes. say anything that Victor spends that much time on is going to be cool? Can we can oh, yeah. we just all agree to that? I agree. I mean, Victor's awesome. Yep. And if he's going to spend that much time on it, it's probably going to be pretty awesome. So if you haven't checked out NX or if you're if you're leery, give it a, give it a check ski because it's pretty cool. It is very cool. Like yeah. So what's next for you? Hmm. Hopefully more talks, okay. conference talks. I have a few ideas, maybe some blog posts as I, I don't know. It, yeah. I just don't want to write a blog post about something that doesn't seem interesting. Yeah. Um, but that's just me, probably the whole imposter syndrome thing. Like, Oh, no one cares about this. And then it might help someone if I do it. So yeah, I'm stuck in that rut right now of imposter syndrome. Like, no, no one needs to know that, you need to uh, import the routing module. Like they do. Exactly. Uh, they do. They, they, do. they do. So, um, so more talks, more blog posts, hopefully, and more meetups, maybe probably. Yeah. More conferences and more learning more new things. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, it's I, I I enjoyed working with you at NGConf, so I hope that I I hope all the best for you as you keep uh, as you keep growing as a speaker. So thanks, so that's me awesome. too. Um, it was right. a blast. I, I really liked it. It was great. It was a crazy first talk experience. Like, yeah, that's a tough one. Going straight to NGConf is tough. Yeah, but it was but good. You did it. Yeah, it's good. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on to to the pick section of Zoom okay. podcast. I've got a pick. And it's one I'm actually pretty excited about. Um, ye old TypeScript just announced beta 3.7. Mm. And in there, for those who uh, are learning, there is a new feature that you want. Trust me. Um, it's called optional chaining. And let me describe it. It, it. it means, you know how sometimes, like, if an object has... If like if an object has a foo property, then you want to get foo dot bar out of that object, right? Yep. So you kind of have to do this, but maybe the object is undefined. So you kind of have to do this if object and object dot foo, right? Mm -hmm. You kind of have to do this that whole thing. Well, uh, and you have to do the if statement because if you reference object of foo and objects undefined, then it's going to, you're going to get a can't get foo of undefined error, right? Like you're going to get that every right. single time. And if foo is undefined, you can't get the bar off the foo. So you're going to get another one. That's like, if you know, if can't get a property bar of undefined. So you have multiple risks there, but in TypeScript, there's this new thing called optional in TypeScript 3.7. It's called optional chaining. And this is a feature that's being considered by the TC 39. And I, I, I'm not actually sure where it's at with them, but, if you say, if you, in your code, you just type object O dot foo dot bar, you could get errors. But if you do O question mark dot foo dot bar. Yep. So you can just awesome. drop that question mark in there and then it kind of takes care of the error handling and the undefined catching. So yeah, it's the, it's the Elvis operator in, in TypeScript. Exactly. So I'm excited about it's, it. Um, I am too. I've been watching that for the JavaScript thing. I didn't realize that TypeScript three, seven actually put it in there. So now it's like quickly, let's go to three, seven quickly. Yeah. yeah hopefully that, uh, cause I think that's, that's a holy crap. That's awesome. Yeah. That'll be great. That combined with default parameters. Mm-hmm. And some other things really does shore up a lot of extra if 
statements. So anyway, that's my pick. TypeScript 3 out 7 with optional chaining. That's a great pick. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, my pick, as soon as you brought up TypeScript 3.7, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to pick the uh, optional chaining thing from JavaScript and hope that that gets through. But um, no, that was great. Uh, my pick is actually NX because I've been, like I said, I've been learning a lot about it. It's pretty amazing. And I want to continue to learn more about it. And it, it's not for everybody. It's not for every use case, but it is for a good amount of use cases especially just the whole library and pulling your stuff in the way that they explain just putting all of your components in a library and then pulling them into your app instead of everything living in your app. That just sounds like a really cool and useful architecture. So yeah, it's very cool. That is awesome. Cool. We'll we'll put links to these in the show notes. These are good picks. So Brad, thanks for coming on today. If if anyone out there has questions about maybe speaking or maybe about any other elements or anything else that you've talked about, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, probably Twitter at Sonic park at at Sonic park with an E. So S O N I C P A R K E is my Twitter handle. Okay. Yep. So Sonic park Park with an E at the end with an E at the end. Okay, cool. Well, uh, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, it's always great for the, the listeners really enjoy getting to meet new people and, and speakers from other events. So thanks for coming on and being oh, absolutely. Being I, someone this, we could get to know better. This is exciting. Actually, I have another pick. Okay, go ahead. I want to pick Adventures in Angular because um, for me, four years ago when I started getting into Angular, I found that podcast and I started listening to it then and learning a whole lot through then. So for me to now be coming up and doing, being on podcasts like that, is really freaking exciting and amazing. So I want to thank you and Chuck and Joe and all the people for uh, actually putting that out there because I've actually learned a ton from listening to that. Um, And it was awesome because when I did my interview for Sapphire Digital, trying to get my first pure dev job doing Angular, they're like, how do you keep up with stuff? I said, podcasts. I listened to Adventures in Angular. I listened to another one. Um, and, uh, that's where I learned stuff. So that is actually very awesome. So thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. I, uh, I'm similar. I love podcasts. I've learned so much from arbitrary comments that this, the people on the podcast thought probably weren't meaningful. They mm-hmm. meant a lot to me. So I'm the same as you. I really, I really like podcasts. So. Yes. So. Cool. Well, thanks for picking that. It is a, it's, it's a show that takes a lot of time and, and effort. So I appreciate that you uh, picked it. Have you been listening to the recent episodes? I listened to a few. I listened to Manfred's. I listened to Victor's. Several months ago, we brought on Brian Love as like a permanent panelist. And we got mm-hmm. Jennifer Wadella. And um, Alyssa's always there. Shy's regularly there. Joe Ames is there. I just love, I love everyone's dynamic. I love the dynamic that Brian and, and Jennifer bring in because I think they're a lot of fun. So That's cool. So, yeah. so yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun to watch the transition, you know, different hosts go through Ward and John and yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, they're still on the invites. They're just busy, busy guys. So that's cool. So yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. And to the listener, I will say uh, thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time. Awesome. Thanks. Peace. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C A C H E F L Y dot